So we are live. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, we are here for the fifth talk in our uh, uh, Let's Talk Primates 2.0 uh, series of webinars uh, presented by Association of Indian Primatologists. I'm MS Ram. I'll be hosting your talk for tonight. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Inza Kone, who is uh, very well known uh, in uh, primatological circuits around the world. So I'll just give a small introduction of uh, Dr. Kone, and uh, then I'll hand it over to Kone for, uh, uh, for his talk. So uh, in, Dr. Inza Kone is a full-time professor of uh, conservation biology at the University Felix Hufubwani in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, since uh, to July 2018, he has been the Director General of the Centre Suisse, the Research Scientifique on Cote d'Ivoire, uh, or the Swiss Centre for Scientific Research in Ivory Coast. In Ivory Coast, his work focuses on the management of natural resources and the conservation of large mammal species, particularly primates. Uh, his work links ecology, economy, and the culture for the environment uh, for the empowerment of rural communities. Inza has won several uh, uh, international and national accolades, including the Future for Nature Award from Netherlands, the 2012 Bitly uh, Award for Nature Conservation from the UK. And he's also served as uh, uh, an active member in several international uh, professional organizations. He has been the president of African Primatological Society since 2017. And uh, the co-vice chair of the African section of IUCN primate uh, specialist groups, among several other uh, uh, big list of uh, achievements that I, uh, uh, I don't, I'm sure people can look it up. And uh, Dr. Kone, uh, if you can uh, uh, begin the presentation, maybe. Okay. Thank you very much, Ram. Thank you for inviting me to share my experience with the Society of uh, Indian Primatologists. As you said, I also represent the African Primatological Society. So being invited by a sister association is just a great honor. So the talk will be about community empowerment for the conservation of endangered primates in Southeastern Cote d'Ivoire. The talk will be structured around five different points. After a short introduction, I'll say a few words about the conservation status of primates in Cote d'Ivoire. I'll present the Tanwe Eriyi Community-Based Conservation Project, its outcome, and finally, lesson learned uh, with emphasis on the role of research. Cote d'Ivoire is located in West Africa in the middle of the upper Guinean biodiversity hotspot, comprising the coastal Atlantic coastal forest of West Africa, extending from Guinea in the west until Benin in the east. For this reason, I mean, the area is characterized by large concentrations of endemic species, meaning species that you can find nowhere else and species that are at the same time frightened. Of note is that Cote d'Ivoire harbors the highest primate diversity in West Africa after Nigeria. Upper Guinea, so the Upper Guinean biodiversity hotspot may be subdivided in two different parts. You have Upper Guinea West and Upper Guinea East. The border between the two different parts being the Sassandra River uh, located in Cote d'Ivoire. So this red thing represents the Sassandra River just behind on the map. We have 22 species of primates in Cote d'Ivoire, and most of them are threatened species. So we have six critically endangered species, four endangered species, five vulnerable species, and other near threatened or least concerned species which means that we have up to 68% of threatened species occurring in Cote d'Ivoire. We have different sets of these species, whether we are in Western Cote d'Ivoire or Eastern Cote d'Ivoire. 
Western Côte d'Ivoire is characterized by large forest blocks like the Thai National Park represented here, which is the largest uh, forest block uh, pr of primary forest under protection in West Africa. And you also have in the Thai forest, long-term primary research project like the Thai Chimpanzee Project, more than 40 years old now, and the Thai Monkey Project, which is more than 30 years old. And you also have very important conservation projects with most big international NGOs, bilateral uh, cooperation, and so on. To the contrary, Eastern Côte d'Ivoire is represented by, I would say, is characterized by exacerbated threats to primates and their habitats. There is a kind of lack of interest from primate conservationists and researchers in this area that has been neglected until very recently. Yet, this part of the country houses the most endangered primates in Côte d'Ivoire. Primate habitat is threatened in Côte d'Ivoire by two phenomena, deforestation and forest fragmentation. Indeed, Côte d'Ivoire experiences one of the highest rates of deforestation in the world, up to 6% of forest loss every year. Since we gained independence in 1960, we lost 67% of our forest cover and forest fragmentation is very widespread. And most forest fragments are small in size, uh, in average 10 hectares, just that. The drivers of deforestation can be divided between direct drivers and indirect drivers. The direct drivers are in order of merit or by decreasing order, agricultural expansion, logging, and infrastructure development. Among indirect drivers, the most important are economic factors because forest destruction is much more rewarding, economically speaking, as compared to conservation. And this is followed by political factors. So problem of governance, but also problem of security in the area related to wars and so on. And we have demographic, uh, demographic factors that are also playing important role in driving to deforestation. As a consequence of habitat destruction and also over hunting, I would say poaching, primate fauna is dwindling everywhere in the country. In less than 20 years, we lost 90% of the chimpanzee population size. And several primate species have been exterminated from most areas of their historical range. This is the case for Miss Waldron's red colobus. This monkey has not been observed by a scientist for more than 40 years. The last time it was observed by Santis was 1978 in a forest block in Western Ghana. Other species are also stimulated like uh, the Diana Guinon or white nap mangabees, and even some common species do not occur anymore in some forests of their historical range. So this is alarming situation. And the alert has already been given by the African Primate Action Plan in its first version in 1986. This action plan recommended that Southeastern and South Central Côte d'Ivoire be investigated to identify top priority sites for primate conservation and also to study the final transition around the Sassandra River, which I recall is the border between Upper Guinea East and Upper Guinea West. So this is a kind of hybridation zone. What was done 10 years after this recommendation? Just a series of inventories of chimpanzees by Hope Dominique started in 1991. This fact highlights once again the lack of interest for this area extending 
east of the Sassandra River in Cote d'Ivoire. Then, in a reverse version of the African Primate Action Plan, the recommendations were to follow the recommendation of the former plan, especially by conducting surveys to find Rollaway Greenon, Watnap Mangabe, and Miss Wildron's Red Colobus, because it was getting more and more evident that these monkeys were being driven to extension. What was done in the following 10 years after these recommendations? A series of surveys by Megro and collaborators started in the, uh, in the late 90s. And they recommended that we upgrade the status of protected forests of Eastern Cote d'Ivoire, because we had some protected forests, but for which law enforcement was not very strict. Actually, these were timber for, uh, production forests. And they recommended that these timber production forests are, are upgraded, I would say, to national parks, for instance. And they were very pessimistic about the fate of the non-protected forests located in the extreme southeast of the country. Then in 2004, I started with my teammates a new series of surveys in this zone extending east of the Sassandra River, so South Central and Southeastern Cote d'Ivoire. And this led us to create the RASAPC program or project, which is the first long-term primate research and conservation project in Southeastern Cote d'Ivoire. As I said in the beginning, most long-term projects would occur in Western Cote d'Ivoire, especially in the Thai National Forest. And of notice that this is the first project led by a local, and uh, I would say, extending over the long term. So what we did in the beginning consisted in surveys in South Central and Southeastern Cote d'Ivoire. In South Central Cote d'Ivoire, we surveyed up to 10, even more uh, sites. And in Southeastern Cote d'Ivoire, we surveyed eight different sites. What we found was confirmation of that habitat destruction and poaching were really widespread in this area. So here you have an image of a plantation within a protected area, within a national park. This is the Marawi National Park in South Central Cote d'Ivoire. So this is a new agricultural clearing in the same national park. Uh, I think that was in 2005. So this national park is almost completely destroyed today. And this is a chain chan so mining sign in the Tanwe A forest, which is a non-protected forest in the southeastern corner of Cote d'Ivoire. As a poaching, as I said, is also very widespread uh, in this part of the country. So if you have here a diker being uh, prepared that has been killed from the Marawi National Park in South Central Cote d'Ivoire. And here, this is a carcass of a critically endangered primate species, Watnap Mangabe, that was close to a timber produ uh, production forest uh, in coastal Cote d'Ivoire. And here, a fresh carcass of a green monkey that was found in the Azani, no, Il, uh, Eotile Islands National Park, so in southeastern Cote d'Ivoire. This is, I would say, notable because green monkeys are not supposed to occur in the forest zone of the country. They are supposed to occur further north in the savannah area. But this was the first observation of green monkeys in the forest area by a scientific team. And it's been confirmed that many troops of this monkey did, do occur uh, indeed uh, in this Eotile Island National Park until today. Uh, I even put a MSc student on them last year. 
As for primary status, in South Central Cote d'Ivoire, we did not find, I would say, our focal species. So we started with three different focal species, uh, White Nap Mangabe, Diana Rollaway, and Miss Wildrons Recolobus, who represented the most threatened species, or three of the most threatened species in West Africa at that time, critically endangered, and they were ranked uh, among the top 20 threatened species in the world. And with time, the white type colobus also became one of the most threatened species. So we included this species among our focal species. But as I said, in South Central Cote d'Ivoire, we could not confirm the existence of this species unless, uh, except, sorry, in the Dasyoko forest, which is a timber production forest, where we find some, uh, a couple of individuals of Watnap Mangabe and a sacred grove in uh, southeastern, uh, even northern, uh, northeastern uh, Cote d'Ivoire, where we found white type colobus. It means that South Central Cote d'Ivoire, uh, in South Central Cote d'Ivoire, these primates have been almost driven to extinction. In southeastern Cote d'Ivoire, we didn't find any of these monkeys in most forest areas, except in the Tanwe A forest, which is located in the southeastern corner of the country. In this forest, we found all the species, all the focal species of the most endangered primates of West Africa. We even heard calls of Miss Wildron's red colobus. Recall that this monkey has not been observed by a scientist since 1978. But in, 19, uh, in 2006, we heard calls of it in the Eutile Island National Park. But I would say in 2008, we were more than convinced that the monkey would still occur in the Tanwe A forest because we clearly heard calls of this monkey there. But until today, we've, we've not been able to confirm its physical existence. Up to nine primate species occur in the Tanwe forest, located in the southeastern corner of Cote d'Ivoire. So most of them are critically endangered or endangered. And we also have some vulnerable species and some near threatened species. As you can see here that most diurnal primates, all general primates of the Tanwe forest are of conservation concern, which gives a high value to this forest in terms of conservation. The Tanwe A forest extends over 12,000 hectares located in the south eastern corner of Cote d'Ivoire, as I said. And this is the largest forest block remaining in this region. You can see here that the countryside is dominated, the landscape is dominated by all palm plantations and the town of A forest is the only remaining forest uh, in this area. We considered the Tanwe A forest as a top priority site for primate conservation in West Africa because this is the only forest east of the Sassandra River where more than two endangered monkey species have survived. This is the only forest in Cote d'Ivoire where the rollaway guinon may be found. This is a forest where all general primates are of conservation concern. And this is the only forest where the presence of Miss Wildron's red colobus is still suspected with a kind of high confidence. Despite uh, this biological value, the Tanwe A forest is threatened by several factors, poaching, logging, chainsaw mining, also small scale and even industrial scale agricultural clearings. Here you have an image of all palm plantations 
at the immediate periphery of the Tanu forest. This is one of the largest oil palm plantation in the world, but this is not enough for this company. They want to destroy the Tanu forest to extend their plantations. This is another sign of chainsaw mining inside the Tanu forest. And this is a carcass, a fresh carcass of Miss Waldron Red Colobus killed in the Tanu forest in 2000. Because in 2000, I guess, Megro and collaborators have published that this monkey was certainly extinct in the wild. Then, I mean, he doubted uh, reports from, from hunters in the area, and one of them challenged him to show him a carcass of the monkey, and this is what he did. He killed one of the monkeys and sent the picture to Megro, who published it in IGP in 2005, reviving the hope of rediscovering this monkey in the Tanwe A forest. Considering the biological, ecological, and socioeconomic value of the Tanwe A forest, considering the threats to the Tanwe forest, we initiated this community-based conservation program for this forest since 2006. The program or project aims to conserve four of the most endangered primates of West Africa who live sympathetically in this forest, namely white-napped Mangabe, Diana Rollaway Guinon, white-tabbed Colobus, and Miss Waldron's Red Colobus. These monkeys and their historical range had not been the focus of any conservation project before us. This project, the Tanwe A Conservation Project, is an example of how communities can play major roles in conservation activities combined with local development. This is another view of a project. I will go a bit into details. Why community-based approach? The fact is that in Cote d'Ivoire, important measures, important multifaceted measures have been taken for conservation. But despite all these measures, it's clear that conservation policies are failing. And we hypothesize that this is partly due to the exclusions of local communities. I talked about high deforestation rates in Cote d'Ivoire, one of the highest in the world. I talked about the devastating effects of deforestation and hunting on wildlife. And we can talk about the impoverishment of local communities because when they lose their natural capital, they become poorer and poorer. First, the governmental authorities have started to adjust conservation policies, and now they try to focus on community empowerment. They try to promote community empowerment, and laws have been elaborated in this direction. The Tanwe A conservation project has six different components. The first one is research. So we've been doing multidisciplinary research. We started by a socioeconomic diagnosis of the situation. We understood how communities were organized and so on. But we also studied, I would say, the biological components. So we mobilized many, many disciplines, zoology, botany, anthropology, environmental economics, which is very important, and also socio sociology. The second component of a project is awareness raising. So with knowledge, I would say gathered through all these studies, we could also try to raise awareness among communities and among decision makers at all levels. So we've been using different approaches to achieve this, theater performance, video sessions, group discussions, sponsoring public events, and so on, using signboard. So we use all kinds of techniques so as to touch 
the majority of neighboring communities. The third component of the project is community organization and capacity building. So communities are organized around associations based in each village. So maybe nine villages are represented here, but now we have 11 villages in which we have an association, an association sorry, aimed at conservation and local development. These villages beyond, belong to three different districts. So at district level, we have coordinating bodies. So these coordinating bodies will be coordinating the actions in the field carried out by this uh, village-based associations. And at the super level, we have a federation of all these associations, district level association and village level association. And this is uh, it's this federation that will be the interlocutor of the administration and all partners, including my institution. In addition to this community organization scheme, we have been building capacities in the running of such association, in the running of conservation activities. So we trained, uh, we brought technical and logistics support to this association, and we trained farmers, women, eco grads, students, and so on to do many things uh, in this time of forest, or for this time of forest, in the benefit uh, for the benefit of local communities themselves. The fourth component is surveillance. And surveillance here is carried out by locals, by local community members. From time to time, they invite official park rangers uh, from time to time. But most of the time, they are autonomous in organizing and conducting patrols. Sometimes they also organize joint patrols with Ghanaian stakeholders, whether community members in Ghana or also park rangers from Ghana. And as I said, independent patrols are the majority of cases. Another component of the forest is support to the forest designation process, because the idea would be to give to this forest a conservation status, because this is a non-protected forest. It's been protected so far because it's a swampy forest. Like you can see here, people have their feet in the mud or in the water. And this is the case in most parts of the forest. So it was difficult for people to convert this forest into agricultural farms. But industrial companies can do that. They can dry the forest and they try to do it. I'll come back to this. And another component of the forest is support to local development because it's not just about telling people do not cut the forest, do not kill the animals. What do you provide as alternative to alternative livelihoods? So it is very important that you pay attention to the well-being of local communities, to their economic growth, economical growth, and so on. So it's very important to also support farming, agroforestry, and a diverse form of well-being improvement in the area. Let's give some highlights about this project, this conservation project. One thing that we can bring about is that this is a good example of application of good governance principles. So there are five different principles that should be applied in conservation projects. Define membership and geographic area. So it's clear, all these villages around the forest feel a kind of membership feeling. And they know for which area they are fighting. So things are clearly defined. The second principle is to build on legitimate, recognized structures. And this is what we did by creating associations in all villages and also at district level, at supra level, and so on. Another important thing, another important principle is to create or elaborate institutional mechanisms
to enable decisions. So this is very clear. I talked about coordinating bodies. I talked about execution bodies. And I also talked about this federation, which is the supervision body. Decision mechanisms are clear. And it is also important to devolve responsibility, uh, responsibility and rights to communities. This is what we do, community empowerment. And people want to have the right to access some natural resources in the forest. They were reluctant in creating a national park which would exclude them from access to some natural resources like fishing, non-timber product, products, and so on. So these rights should be devolved back to them. And another principle is sustainability. So by building capacities, by diversifying partnerships and so on, we try to build sustainability. Another highlight is the activism that we did in 2008 when an OPAM company wanted to destroy 6,000 hectares of the Tanwe A forest. So we put communities at the front lines of this fight and we finally managed to stop it. And very recently, so last year, it was a gold mining project at the periphery, at the close periphery of the project. And we also managed to stop this. Another highlight is synergy that we've been developing with Ghana. So here we are standing in Ghana, organizing a workshop with people from WAPCA, the West African Primate Conservation Action, and also representative of local communities. We are there, so I'm here with some members of communities coming from Cote d'Ivoire who meet with uh, members uh, from Ghana. And here we are standing in Ghana and you can see the Tanwe River here. Beyond the Tanwe River, you have the Tanwe Forest. So this signboard is one of our signboards to show the limits of the forest. As you can see in this part, there's no Ivorian village. This is Ivory Coast and the other side of the river and we are here in Ghana. So people from Ghana go in the forest because there's no Ivorian village over 100 kilometers and so on. They cut trees and bring them in the Ghanaian side. So for this reason, it is very important to strengthen our collaboration with Ghanaian stakeholders. The project has been recognized nationally and internationally by IUCN. We participated in the latest uh, World Parks Congress uh, in 2014 with not less than five different talks. And I've been invited together with 21 other conservation champions from Africa. And our stories have been documented in a book that has been published by IUCN Papako. And uh, following the World Parks Congress, uh, my work has also been highlighted by the Panorama Initiative of IUCN as a, one of the good solutions for a healthy planet. So you can go on this link and see the solutions that I propose through this project. The project has been awarded several times. In 2009, I received a Future for Nature Award because I managed to stop this all time company uh, project and in 2012, I received a Whitley Fund for Nature Awards because I managed to demonstrate to the communities that conservation can go hand in hand with development. And uh, more recently, I received uh, another award from Switzerland for the quality of research in partnership, so North-South partnership for the conservation of the Tanway Forest. And uh, I also received a national award for excellence in research. So we published a lot uh, about the Stanley Forest. We trained several PhD students, several MSc students, and uh, these two recognitions were about uh, this contribution. We continue our activities. So one key activity uh, going on is the development of green value chains in cassava and in non-timber forest products. And we also continue the forest designation process. 
we hope that we are at the least latest stage of this uh, pro uh, process. And we continue to develop capacities, so individual or institutional capacities, uh, both in conservation or local development. And of course, we continue research. Research on human wildlife conflicts, so a PhD will soon be defended on this topic. Another one is well advanced on the diversity of rodents in the Tanwei forest. And we have intensified research for Miss Wadron Rest Colobus since uh, last year. Uh, we continue uh, camera trapping in, in the canopy. So uh, this is a camera being set in the canopy in the Tanwei forest. And this provides very, very exciting results. We haven't seen Miss Wadron yet, but we have amazing images of all of the uh, all the other primates of the Tanu forest and many vertebrates, uh, arboreal vertebrates. And finally, we also have a PhD trying to elaborate a biomonitoring system that is adapted to swampy areas. Uh, we are trying to work on this. Some outcomes of the project, reduce intensity of poaching activities, reduce intensity of chainsaw mining. So we do bear monitoring, as I said, and we have evidence of that. These activities are being reduced in intensity. And we have been able to avoid the destruction of 12,000 hectares of swampy forests, of wetlands. So we disabled a kind of carbon bomb. And we have signs that wildlife is thriving because human wildlife conflicts are being more and more uh, frequent in the area, which is not uh, necessarily good, but which is a good sign of conservation success. Another outcome is the number of locals that are skids in the area. So, whether in conservation, in smart agriculture, or in forest management, we have more and more people in each village who can talk about sustainable development, who can talk about conservation issues. And we've been raising awareness among communities. Everybody is aware of the existence of the forest. Everybody is aware of the conservation, in conservation value of the monkeys of this forest monkeys that you cannot find anywhere else on the planet. What makes it work? Enabling factors are the focus that we put on the rehabilitation of traditional knowledges and traditional knowledges and values in a modern context. It's also very important to be patient and flexible when you work with local communities. You cannot just come and pretend to achieve your outcomes in six months. You have to be flexible. You have to take your time. You have to understand their constraints. You have to be by their side over the long term. And for this, you need to diversify your funding mechanism. You have to ensure the sustainability of your funding mechanism. These are the enabling factors. The component that leads to success are research and action. So in here, we are in a kind of iterative process where research feeds actions and vice versa. This is the key secret of the success of this conservation project. To say a few words about the importance of research. Thanks to research, we've been able to demonstrate the biological dimension of the conservation value of a Tanway A forest. Because indeed, we started, uh, we surveyed all mammals, most mammal species occurring there, birds, fishes, amphibians, and plants. And we have figures about, I would say, the occurrence of very important species occurring in this forest. And we also evaluated the carbon stock the carbon stock by plants, by the, by the plant biomass, which is up to 4 million of tons 
per year. And we have good, I would say, finding about the ecology of fishes and primates in this region. So we've been able to demonstrate that mangroves in this area play a very important role in the reproduction of fishes, which would finally feed fisheries, which is a very important socioeconomic activity in the area. The biological of the biological value of a forest may be summarized uh, by this table. So nine primary species occurring in the forest, and none, uh, all nine of them are of conservation concern. More than 270 bird species, including 12 species of conservation concern, more than 38 amphibian species, including 10 of conservation concern, meaning endemic species or threatened species and so on, and more than 22 fishes, including two species of conservation concern. And we have also 33 plant species of conservation concern in this Tanway A forest. Thanks to research, we also have a good idea of the socioeconomic dimension of the value of the Tanway forest. Because we studied local perception, we studied socio sociocultural drivers, of communities' commitment for conservation. We understand fair motivation so we can play on these things to stimulate more and more commitment. And finally, we, through research, through environmental economic research, we have good ideas of the costs and benefits of conservation in this area. So just uh, a couple of images to illustrate the socioeconomic value of the tiny forest. So forest resources are used on a daily basis by local communities for medicinal plants, for, I would say, food, for firewood, for construction, for manufacturing, and so on and so on. And there are many cultural practices uh, in the tiny forest. So some uh, animal species, even primate species, are also sacred species, and there are sacred groves inside the forest. So cultural aspects are very, very important. And finally, we have a good uh, set of data on agriculture and fishery, depending on, I would say, the existence of the Tanwe forest. This is a model to describe how research feeds action and vice versa. Here in yellow, you have different kind of studies that you may do. So this model may apply to a community managed forest or even to a national park. The role, uh, the, the link between research and action for conservation. So in yellow, you have the different types of studies that you can do. In blue, you have the outputs of these studies. And in green, you have the outcomes. If I consider, for instance, biological service, thanks to biological service, you may raise awareness because you have an idea of the biological value of the forest. You may raise awareness, and when you raise awareness, you induce a kind of change of behavior, which will in turn result in the long-term conservation of the forest. If you take the case of uh, the study of economical activities. This kind of study will help you design a development plan for the area. With this development plan, communities will have financial benefits. And when they have financial benefits, they will change behavior or these financial benefits will directly impact the conservation. If they change behavior, this will also impact conservation. So we can try to describe how each kind of study leads to a change of behavior and finally uh, to the conservation of the Tanway forest. And as I said, this kind of model may be applied even to a national park. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your kind attention. I would like to thank this set of donors. This list is not exhaustive. Uh, to say that 
in more than 10 years, we've been collaborating with multiple partners from uh, Africa and beyond Africa, USA, Europe, and so on. Thank you to all these partners, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kony. Uh, I'll ask uh, Smita to come in and take the questions from here. Uh, Smita, it's all yours. Can you just unmute yourself and then you can carry it? Uh, that was a lovely talk, sir. That was quite inf informative. And we have a few questions for you this evening. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Inga, are you, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. OK. <laughs> ah, there. <laughs> Okay, so, so for the the first question for this evening is it is uh, is from Vinod. He is complimenting you. He says it's a very interesting and valuable talk. Conservation of last individuals of primates in the in that area. His question is whether red colobus carcass is confirmed by any molecular study. Uh, I'm not sure. But before this carcass, uh, there, there, there have been skin of the same monkey that has been sent to uh, Scott Megro. And on this skin, they did uh, molecular studies, which confirmed that indeed this was a skin from uh, Miss Wadron Red Colobus. As for the carcass, we have two kinds of uh, Red Colobus monkeys in West Africa. And these, their characteristics are very clear. What we saw in this picture can be identified with no doubt as a miswadron red colobus. Because the head is different from the Western colobus that you find in the Thai forest. The color of the fur is also different from what you see uh, from red colobus in the Thai forest or elsewhere. Uh, so we identified with no doubt that this is a carcass of miswadron red colobus. <laughs> that's that's uh Comforting. The next question is from Ram. Where and how should we draw the line with regards to devolving rights to natural resources? Are the local communities involved in this decision? If yes, in what capacity? Yeah, as I said, uh, this is a community empowerment process, which means we are not coming to create a national park and exclude communities from the management or from access to natural resources. Uh, this is what the community said clearly. Yes, we do understand the conservation value of the forest. We acknowledge that this is the only remaining forest of the area. This is the only chance for future generations to see some species and so on. This is the only chance for our agriculture to be sustainable. So communities knew the value of the forest. But the fact powerless in terms of conserving it, because as I said, this forest uh, is also of interest for agricultural companies, for industrial companies, and so on. So community communities used to feel powerless in terms of preventing these big companies, logging companies, and agricultural companies to destroy the, uh, their heritage. It's there that we play the role. We said, yes, we can empower you. And we can show you your rights and responsibilities. And they, they like this, absolutely. And then they said, OK, we don't want a national park because we also live on, I would say, forest resources. As, as, as you saw the pictures, most uh, construction things, uh, medicine, uh, manufacture, uh, even, uh, I would say, uh, firewood and so on, Everything comes from the forest. And fisheries is one of the most important economic activities in the, in the region. From one of our socioeconomic studies, we demonstrated that 80% of the people living in the five villages that are closest to the forest live especially on fisheries and a little bit on agriculture, which means that fisheries is very important. So communities wanted to still have access to these natural resources. And we said, this is feasible. We just have to make the difference between endangered species and species that can be exploited uh, sustainably. And they have this uh, in, in their habits. 
uh, in, on the Tanwe River, for instance, they practice fisheries as well. And they have their own traditional system to make this fishery sustainable. There are periods where the fishery is completely closed, and there are periods where it's open. And uh, also, the way, uh, the size of fishes that you can get from the Tanwe River is also controlled by a team that nobody taught them how to do that. They, this is something that they've been doing. We just try to copy this. Uh, to extend it to the forest conservation. Okay. Uh, our next question is from a community of young scientists, learn and explore. They have a doubt. We have all been hearing that nature and human go hand in hand, but there is always a debate that people who live nearby the natural reserve area are, are having negative impact on wildlife. So what would you like to say on that? Yeah, uh, this is a fact, and uh, this can be understood. This is understand understandable. Uh, but if you say then that you can protect the natural resources against these communities, who can be the best defenders of these resources, you go straight to a failure. And this is the case for most national parks. So the concept was that, was the top-down approach, you come, you say, this is a protected area. You don't have right to access here. You don't have uh, right to access natural resources and so on. And communities are excluded. But how many ranges can you send in this field to for an effective protection of thousands of hectares of forest? You never have enough manpower to do this. So the right. best thing right. to do, the best thing to do is to empower communities put them in face of their responsibilities. And all they need is also to have alternative livelihoods. Because most of the time, people would understand, yes, indeed, the forest is important. Yes, indeed, the monkeys are important. But we want to live, we want to survive. We don't have any alternative. That's why you should bring them support to uh, alternative livelihoods. Uh, they have a follow-up question, sir, and we have also heard that plantation of palm oil have also brought in decline of primate species. And what can one do to bring out, uh, to benefit for human and wildlife? Uh, not sure I understood the question, so I'm reading it again. <laughs> yes, sure. Uh, is the question about uh, the benefits for human, the benefits of what, palm, palm oil? Uh, I guess, yes. But okay. I, I, okay, should we just okay. pass this question? Or do yes. you want any comments? Do we okay. pass it? If, if I get it this way, <laughs> uh, we are not saying that we don't want of uh, all pine plantation uh, because this is important for development somehow. They create jobs, they create infrastructures and so on. And they also uh, try to satisfy the needs of local uh, human communities and so on. But what we try to say is that do they need to have plantation over tens of kilometers, like it is the case in the, in the region where I work, when you travel to the Tamil forest, you'll be driving for more than 10 minutes. To your right and to your left, you see just all pine. Was that important? Was that needed? I believe that not, not at all. They can produce in a more sustainable way, uh, to, not to destroy, I would say, pristine forest over hectares and hectares, over kilometers and kilometers. You can alternate between all pine plantations, forest patches, and so on. So you should have a, I would say, complex landscape, not just a homogeneous landscape dominated by plantation. This is nonsense. Uh, this, this is the fact. 
well that will also have its own ecological imbalance but definitely having uh, acres and acres and lands of uh, palm oil plantation is not going to help any primate for sure a <laughs> uh, next question is from ram again how do you create awareness among the local communities about the dangers of over exploitation of the resource forest resources yes as i said uh, they already have this uh, this sense of assuring sustainability. Uh, they, they apply this to fisheries. Uh, as I said, fisheries are very well organized. They have patrolling teams, surveillance teams. Uh, and yeah, once somebody do, does not respect the rules, uh, there are mechanisms for punishment and so on. Uh, it may pay for fines and so on. So this is something which is in their habits already. And I also said that there are sacred groves inside the forest, which means that they uh, give a certain value to the protection of these sacred groves. Uh, this is important for the spirit of their ancestors and so on. Uh, and they even have some strong links to some of the species, uh, like uh, white tag uh, colobus, uh, which is very important, uh, I would say, uh, in case, for instance, uh, somebody is cursed, uh, you, you may use faces of these monkeys for in some rituals, and this person is no, not cursed anymore. So they have this sense of the value of uh, natural resources. They also have this uh, understanding of, uh, I would say, the fact that uh, these resources cannot be there uh, forever. Uh, that, but because when you do socioeconomic diagnosis, for instance, you'll ask them, uh, what was the situation of forest uh, 20 years ago? They would say, you had plenty of forest here. Uh, what was the situation of wildlife? You even have elephants, but now you cannot see all these animals. You see no more forest. Only. So they know that natural resources are being destroyed. Based on these facts, you can show how important it is to develop sustainable mechanisms. And they understand and we can practice this. Right. Uh, our last question for today is from Erin Kane. Uh, Dr. Kone, it's great to hear you talk about the wonderful work in Tanoi Forest. Do you have much hope for forests in the central part of the country, or is deforestation too extreme? Yes, I know I know Erin. Uh, she she works in the Thai forest, so I, I agree, sir. <laughs> by the way, and I know she knows Cote d'Ivoire. She knows what she's talking about. Talking about central Cote d'Ivoire, she talks about the Marawe National Park. And in my presentation, I talked a lot about this Marawe National Park. Uh, in the when when I started my study in 2004, this park was already uh, very 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 distraught. And this trend continued until today. So today, there's not much left in this forest, in this national park. And you even have conflicts posed by elephants going outside these parks and going to big towns that are not far. Uh, but this is not the reason why I'm not there. Uh, I, I, can, I, I try to do what I can uh, to raise awareness about the importance of this forest. But uh, I mean, uh, I gave you an idea of the conservation value of this non-protected forest, the Tanway Eight Forest, which is a non-protected forest for which uh, Scott Megro, which is we, who was the supervisor of, of Eric Kett, was pessimistic. I've been optimistic to say, this forest is not lost. We can save it. We can save it by empowering communities. And this is my major contribution to conservation. Doesn't mean that I don't do anything else. I still work in Thai. I still work in other areas <laughs> yeah, where I can do something. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so uh, with this, with the note that uh, conservating uh, a, a forest is important and it becomes even more effective when we have the communities working hand in hand with us and it takes a lot of work to go to the communities and empower them, teach them that they need to conserve and how to conserve. And uh, Dr. Inga Kone's story, thank boxes through different various different methodologies that it can be done and thank you so much for taking your time off today sir and helping us understand and giving us an insight into 
problems in Africa. We do have similar problems uh, in India as well. And I guess all of us have uh, got ideas from your talk and how on how to conserve what's uh, remaining. With this, I would also like to thank all our viewers from across the world who have uh, kept uh, encouraging us in different ways and who have kept this uh, communication and talks happening. We are bringing this, uh, we are trying to bring uh, more speakers on board so that we can have more con more collaborations on our uh, on this platform. Uh, our next talk, <laughs> our next talk is going to be by uh, Professor Erin Riley on the twenty on the twentieth of no on the tenth of September. She's going to be talking about sustainable coexistence of human and non-human primates in the twenty-first century probably a continuation of what uh, Professor Kone has been speaking all this, uh, speaking this evening. And uh, and with this, I would like uh, Professor Kone to have the last words. So do you have anything to say? Oh, just okay. thank you. Thank you again to the Indian Society of Primatologists. Uh, yeah, as, as a sister society, I mean, the African Primatological Society uh, I, I've had uh, a lot of interaction with sister societies, and uh, I'm very excited to to be developing something with uh, the Indian Society of Primatologists. So, yeah, thank you very much. We're very glad to have you on board, sir. With this, we are ending the talk.